Rich, I want to get your take as a conservative commentator. It is oft repeated that the press is, it leans liberal, um, and now with the, the proliferation of social media, anything can be said at any time, whether it be true, false, left, right. There is a grave concern across the country that some information can become dangerous information, particularly when there is sort of this maelstrom of information that has now affected our election. What is the solution in a free speech society when um, there is concern that there's fake news and there truly is fake news out there. I don't believe CNN is fake news, but there truly is fake news out there. What is the concern and what is the solution to those concerns? Well, I think the concern, and, and, and I don't think, I know I'm speaking for the entire right wing of the country here, but <laughs> I, I, I don't think that even, even the, the, the furthest right uh, believe that there should be any inroads on, on the First Amendment. I think, and, and I'm guessing, what, what the president's frustration there and the frustration of many of us on the right is, at what point, at what point does an organization cease being a news organization and therefore maybe shouldn't have all the protections, for example, of the libel laws. Uh, uh, if, if a news organization is issuing opinions and, and doing them as news, uh, at, at what point are, should they be subject to some kind of scrutiny? Uh, as opposed to, this is news versus this is the editorial, and you know, we could editorialize however we want. If I could jump in here. I mean, I, I, I think one answer to your question, Ashley, is that kind of speech deserves more speech, right? I mean, that's the kind of society that we have where, you know, you know our, our, uh, the, the First Amendment and a robust uh, and, and free press, um, because if you have more speech, then uh, those uh, sort of falsehoods will be brought out. Um, and I and I think you know to, to address your your question a little bit. I mean, opinion is protected, right? So I I, I, I do take a little bit of issue um, between saying that someone can't give their opinion. Um, but it doesn't need to be labeled. No, it doesn't need to be labeled to be protected. No, not I at all. I think, Rich, isn't that what you're saying? There needs to be a clear uh, division between news and opinion, and, and when it isn't clearly uh, outlined, they blend. Yeah, I think with, I'd like to see, and again, without infringing on the First Amendment and without regulating, uh, I, I think one of the frustrations is the kind of the melding of news and advocacy. You're talking uh, about Fox News now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't say that. <laughs> I, <laughs> it's very pensive. Right. This may sound strange because I'm following somebody, going back to you, Floyd, who's written the book, really, on First Amendment. And you were suggesting, the way I heard you, I heard you suggesting that we don't have to worry too much because there's some things, some things can't happen. Anything can happen. I think we should all be deeply worried. We should be worried to our core. In 1929 and 1930, a Spanish philosopher, Ortega y Gasset, wrote about something strange happening in Spain. People who knew nothing, right? so forget about, writing the, forget about writing the book, think about people who do not care about books. People who knew nothing were demanding the right to be treated as if they knew things. People who couldn't be bothered to find out about things were demanding and receiving the right to be treated as if they were experts. Ortega y Gasset was predicted accurately the rise of fascism in Spain. The conversations that end with just a winner and a loser and follow no rules because a cultural shift has happened. People no longer care about rules, they just care about winning. The buck stops with the winner. Climate change, that's a complicated question and we could answer it in the language of science. You could show me the things that you have seen in the observable world I could show you the things that I've seen in the observable world. We could compare our results of different experiments. We could look at proofs for different hypotheses. Or we could just say, it's a hoax, and have the power to get away with saying, it's a hoax, and have degraded the population down to the point where discourse doesn't exist. It's just shouting, it's a hoax, it's true, and having the power to impose your truths on others. So I think that 
November 8th, if it shows us anything, it shows us that anything can happen, and we shouldn't turn away from lessons of the past, uh, as in fascist Spain. So, you know, can I ask, just on, on the tales of that, um, Floyd, the Constitution protects free speech uh, through the um, refusal to allow the abridgment of it by Congress, right, by the government. If you lose your job because you say you don't like the boss, that's not the protection of free speech. We're not talking, that those are apples and oranges. But if the president says things out loud, he doesn't actually uh, legislate. He just says things like, everyone in the NFL should be fired if they don't stand for the anthem. And Jerry Jones starts to worry about his product and therefore passes a rule saying, my Dallas Cowboys will be benched if they don't stand for the anthem. Where are we? He didn't legislate it, but he chilled Jerry Jones. That's the government chilling someone with its language, but not with its rule. So where do we stand with free speech there in the First Amendment? Well, uh, first, of course, you're quite right that the First Amendment, the whole Bill of Rights, is just a limitation on the government. It says Congress, but it's been expanded to the president, uh, uh, every city, uh, uh, every employee, every public university uh, is bound uh, by the First Amendment, um, and everything else uh, is not. Uh, there have been a few situations in which uh, pressure of, of such enormity was, was made by government entities on private entities, that when the private entities reacted to it by giving in to it, that in a very few situations, that has been held to be the equivalent of government action. But that said, the president's got First Amendment rights too. Uh, and he has the perfect right, we, we may, and I would condemn it, but, but that's on the merits of what he's saying. Uh, he, he, he is wholly within his constitutional rights to mouth off at the NFL uh, and, at, and at the uh, players uh, who, uh, of whom he disapproves uh, be, because of uh, what they're doing. Now, if the president called Jerry Jones and said in almost so many words, unless you do this, uh, we're, we're going to bring an antitrust action against you, something like that. I, gotta, I, gotta, I have to interrupt you there. In the I'm, next not, administration. I'm not so sure the president does have the same, <laughs> look at me challenging him. Um, <laughs> I'm just a television anchor. Uh, but I am curious about the, the president's free speech rights yeah. are limited when he makes a threat against a constitutional protection. Not really, not really. Uh, where, where, uh, where does that come from, actually? <laughs> Uh, I, I know, it, I know I why it. he has First Amendment rights. You can say he's abusing them, but that's a, a, a social, political, cultural judgment. Uh, I mean, if, if the, the president is, you know, free to speak out, uh, in fact, he can't even be sued in a libel case while he's president because he has immunity as a result of various uh, judicial interpretations. So. Short of a real threat, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's free to speak. Uh, and, and isn't that threatening to revoke licenses even though he doesn't understand he can't? Yeah. Um, isn't that, doesn't that fall under that same threatening behavior? No. A call to the head of the FCC might. Uh, he actually did, I believe, call for um, Ajit Pai to review those licenses, even though, once again, Ajit Pai has said, I am an apolitical body here. I'm not getting into politics with my you know, leadership of the FCC. Right. No, look, at, uh, look, the FCC is the government, too. Uh, so if the FCC lifts a license, the lawsuit that would be brought would be against the United States of America, the Federal Communications Commission, and whatever other names, including the chairman, uh, that the lawyer protesting it. Uh, would uh, would uh, would the state? But what, what I'm saying is that yes, there there is some level of pressure by a president, uh, which is uh, so threatening in its nature 
that that in and of itself it can give rise to a, a claim. But the, but, but the broad general rule is uh, the, the, the president can speak out, and in some ways, the, the president needs more protection than lots of other people do in most circumstances, uh, because as the leader of the country, whether we or I uh, agree that he should be, as the leader of the country, I mean, we don't want uh, judges or juries yeah. and he does enjoy, sitting in judgment he does enjoy a, on whether he's permitted a great amount to, of to say that. So, Christina. Can I, can I jump in for a moment? Yeah. Uh, we have to be careful, though, about judging abnormal situations by normal standards. So there's a way in which this president um, has received a pass, right? He has, when we look at his past behavior, he has now, by threatening uh, newspapers uh, created that extreme situation. One reason why we might say he hasn't is we have a tendency to revert back to our normal space of judgment, to pretend we haven't seen what we have seen before and, pretend, and act like this is now a normal person in the Oval Office. How would I, what would I do toward a normal person? So each week we erase the history of the past week because that's, that's a thing that you do in abusive situations. So, Christina, just with, with respect to what, what Floyd was saying, um, the, the words that the president used are protected by free speech. I, I slightly disagree because I fear that I think that threats are different than opinion. However, you're the senior counsel at Hearst, and Hearst encompasses ESPN, right? And the president had a lot to say about what uh, a female uh, anchor at, CNN, at uh, ESPN said. She enjoyed the luxuries of performing her duties at ESPN for several weeks until she didn't. And then she was suspended for her speech. I would argue that she was suspended because the president continued his tirade on her decision to make the comments that she did. So aren't we seeing that his chill has actually been effectuated? I, 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 Just put your mic up high. I hear yeah. you, yeah. So I, I'm not going to comment on, on, on that, but I am going to sort of talk a little bit about chilling, right, in the sense of what, what you know, is the conduct that's happening here and what kind of chilling is, it, is um, resulting from it? And does it have a chilling effect? Should it, and, you know, should it? And, and of course, I think a lot of us would say it, it, sh it cannot. And I think you know a lot of what has been reported um, is you know focused a little bit on the the it, there's a lot of distraction right so to your point you know we 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 focus on something for a week and then we kind of go on to the next you know issue and we kind of forget about maybe the underlying issue that is really important but we're focusing on the tweet of the moment, and, and, and these tweets of the moment happen when he doesn't want there to be attention on the underlying important issue. So for example, NBC's report, or you know, someone's expression of, of, uh, of their First Amendment rights. So I think you know, right now, um, you know, to, to address your concern about, you know, we've seen this before, we can't let it happen again, I think one thing you're saying is we really need to be focused on these big issues. Journalists really need to be focused and telling people about the big issues, putting the distraction aside, and keeping the pressure on you know, what's really important, and so that the public knows what's going on, and ultimately, um, for democracy's sake, uh, you know, can exercise the, that information when they go to vote. So, Rich, uh, I want to bring you in. That I, that I don't disagree with you, Ashley, that certain statements of the president can, and indeed are intended, to have a chilling effect. All I'm saying is that he's legally protected in making them. So let's let's talk a little bit more about, we were digging into Jamel Hill and the, the take a knee protest uh, that I think everyone, I don't need to explain what it is, I think everyone has been watching it play out on the news for the last several weeks. Rich, a lot of people say this is a First Amendment right to take a knee. Um, sure, it's a First Amendment right, sure. but. Few people sort of dig a little deeper to say, 
First Amendment rights don't come without consequences. You might not be allowed to be jailed for them in our country, but it doesn't mean that there aren't consequences. And I want you to just address that a little. Yeah, and I, I think that, uh, and again, it's intimidating talking about the First Amendment with I mean, you know, seriously, you know, right? sitting here on my lap. Um, so let I'm me preface sweating. everything by saying I, I, I defer to, to, to him and the rest of the panel. Um, yeah, I think that um, the, uh, the, the, the take a knee things, I, 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 think, I don't think anyone, I don't, know what, you know, I, I don't know what the president is tweeting, but I don't think anybody um, is saying that if you do something like take a knee or don't stand, that you could somehow be arrested, right? I mean, that's, that's, I think all of us lay people would say, of course, that's a clear violation of the First Amendment. I agree with you that people might be surprised, and again, I'm, I'm deferring here, but people might be surprised to learn that if you're an NFL player and you take a knee, I guess you could be fired uh, without, uh, without, without infringing a First Amendment right in a, in a legal way, is that? Yeah. Yeah, so. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it may be immoral or it might be against what many people believe, I, I but think it's, it's not illegal. illegal. Yeah, I, no, I, and I don't think it's immoral. I think that it's the First Amendment. That those people have every right to kneel and their bosses have every right to fire them. Um, the government has no right, to my understanding, to take any governmental action that would stop really either party or mandate either party to act in that situation. So has First Amendment run amok? Do people think that they have the right to say whatever they want and not have their CD bulldozed or anything like that? I mean, it seems to me that a lot of Americans aren't clear that the First Amendment uh, does not pertain to your enjoyment. Uh, it's not about your enjoyment. It's about your protection from the government um, from being uh, infringed upon by the government, maybe not jailed necessarily. There's all sorts of other ways that the, the government can infringe on your free speech. But do you see an issue at Hearst whereby people don't see the difference between that? Uh, no, I mean, I, I guess from the, from the perspective of my job, you know, I'm um, I'm an in-house lawyer who works with journalists every day. Uh, some of whom are in, are in the audience, um, uh, and and I I am involved in uh, helping journalists get their stories out, uh, and published in newspapers um, and websites and television and in magazines. Um, so I am looking at it from that perspective of how can we best get um, you know these stories uh, published uh, to to tell the world what's going on. So I don't I don't see that issue. Um, I think, you know, we, I'm very fortunate to work with folks who, who uh, you know, use the First Amendment every day um, in terms of their, their right uh, to, to right of speech. Um, and then we worry about, um, you know, there, there are no restraints on speech prior to publication. You worry about if there are going to be any issues following that publication. Mm. Can I just add a word about the spirit of the First Amendment? The president, some of you may recall, uh, in dealing uh, a few days ago with the Iran deal, said that uh, Iran is violating the spirit of the agreement. Uh, and we'll put that aside for the moment. Uh, but I, I did want to say that the, the, the players who are kneeling in protest are doing, uh, are exercising uh, their speech at great risk to themselves and greater risk all the time to themselves. Uh, uh, and if they were fired or something, it, it would be an egregious violation of the spirit of the First Amendment, the notion that we do live in a country uh, in which people are and should be able to think of themselves as free to engage in that kind of uh, protests. So while it is not protected by the First Amendment, because the Bill of Rights, again, uh, applies only as a protection against the government, uh, it, it doesn't mean that we have to abandon either the, the vocabulary or the, the, the tone and attitude and spirit of living in a country in which free expression is by its nature uh, honored, uh, and we would hope uh, protected. 
Well, Professor Farley, you're teaching constitutional law. You're on campus all the time. Is the spirit of free speech becoming ethereal? Are we forgetting who we are? Um, are we being eroded with regard to the spirit of what this country stands for? Because maybe we're focusing too much, or at least some people are focusing too much on the letter of the law? Well, I think not only are we sometimes focusing too much on the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. We're not even getting the letters right. So we've made a leap just now on the panel um, from uh, a possible First Amendment right as that amendment is currently interpreted by a majority of judges and justices um, to an absolute right of owners to fire people who take a knee in protest. They don't have that absolute right. We'd have to leapfrog over a lot of employment law, a lot of labor management issues, um, a lot of contracts that perhaps have been signed between the municipalities that greatly subsidize the stadiums that these um, athletes play in. Um, there are a whole lot of you know, legal webs um, that we have sort of <laughs> Hello? Okay. Oh, oh, I see. I'm covering. It's temperamental. Right. There are a whole lot of legal webs that we have torn through on the way to going from a discussion of First Amendment law to an absolute right of owners to tell people you are fired. And there's a way in which a country takes on the spirit of its leaders, and that would be unfortunate if that happened to us. Uh, a person who made it to the top by saying, in a fascistic way, you're fired. Right? That's the, like, you know, when you, one of our great industries in this country, I hate to call it an industry, um, is the university. The, the cornerstone of the university is tenure. You can't fire a professor for saying stuff once they have been tenured. So we have an idea that the only way we get ahead as a country, right, ed is education, and the only way we can have real education and real research is to make sure that the people who are doing that research are protected from the mob who might not understand it or the uh, angry people sent over because they disagree with it. Uh, there's a kind of free speech uh, ethic. What's good at university is good everywhere. We should want to see that principle of being able to say what's on your mind flourish um, in a lot of different areas uh, and not be so gung-ho about saying, you're fired to somebody who um, uh, kneels. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, I have to take issue with that. I, I, well, I understand that, um, and, and I, think, um, I think one of the problems that's going on right now is in the universities that are supposed to be these bastions of, of, of thought and give and take and the First Amendment, I think at least we on the right and I think other people are seeing infringements on, on speakers and being able to speak there. Uh, the, you know, the, uh, the safe spaces that, that we talked about not, uh, or talked about earlier. Uh, not, talk, not being able to bring up certain issues, I, I think one of the things we're seeing is universities actually reducing people's uh, First Amendment right um, by effectively, not allowing them effectively to, to voice them. Yeah, that's absolutely not true. That's a thing conservative people say, and it's a, it's a ridiculous argument. I'll, I'll explain why the argument is ridiculous. So universities have to do a new thing nowadays. After segregation, people who are not white get to go to university. Women get to go to university. Um, gay people get to be gay at university and not get kicked out. There are all kinds of people who in the old days would have just been um, chased away with a hammer or a stick or whatever blunt or sharp instruments were nearby. So they're at university now. The rules that say treat those people like everybody else are treated by conservatives as if that's some kind of special dispensation. And they can't bend their mind around, how exactly would I treat a minority, a black person like me? Um, well, you can't treat them like you by ignoring death threats against them. So if somebody flies a Confederate flag, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to look at as a, as a threat of immediate harm. Nobody in modern America waves that, the stars and bars around, the Confederate battle flag around, without saying to black people in the audience, you are in danger from me um, right now. So that flag has to go. That's not something confining speech. It's only when we pretend that somebody going to campus as a member of alt-right alt and saying, kill all the Jews or kill the black people, or Jews will not replace us, as they were saying at my alma mater 
the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Um, it's only when we pretend that that's somehow communicating something other than I'm going to hurt you that it becomes speech. It isn't speech. It might be speech if it's harmless to you, and it's harmless to you if you're white because they're not after you. But if you're not and they're after you, it, that's, then that's not speech. That's an immediate threat. But it is protected by the First Amendment. Well, that depends well, we on... We may not like it, but, but, it, but it is protected. And, and the, the anti-Semitic taunts and chants uh, in Charlottesville and most, but not all, anti-black and anti-minority statements are protected and only protected here I by the First Amendment. Well, I'm going to say a thing. No, they're not protected. They're protected because we have a ridiculous reading of the First Amendment. Oh, yeah. oh, so in, oh, oh. In normal, in normal circum... Well, and by ridiculous, I mean a disproportionate number of people who get to participate in high levels about the discourse of constitutional law are white. The reference group is white. The reference groups are white, male, straight, wealthy. That's the approving class for the people who get to have the most impact when they speak about the First Amendment. If we looked at things in a normal way, and by that I mean a way not biased by class, classism, racism, sexism, uh, heterosexism. We might look at, uh, let's say, a swastika as disorderly conduct. There's all kinds of conduct that's disorderly that we criminalize. We might look at it as intentional infliction of emotional distress. That's a tort. You can walk into court and say, that was outrageous. You directed it at me. It caused me harm, emotional harm. Um, uh, and so I can sue you now for the outrage of it. Um, we, we, we could revive uh, or embolden our group defamation um, ideas. We could look at these things as fighting words. If you decide to go and talk about how the Holocaust didn't happen or the, the, the um, Klan is great or black people are intellectually inferior, then let's say, I'm, not, I'm, I'm a terrible fighter, but if I were, I might punch someone who said that in the face. And it would be fighting, they would have said fighting words to me. So I have a def defense if somebody goes after me for assault. We might, threats, treat things as threats. Threats are also criminal. The law, criminal law can go after threats. But we pretend that But they have things, to be very specific. And I think the difference Well, let me be specific. That, these, these, well, let me, let me sure. just outline what I mean by it has to be very specific. I don't like your boyfriend is not the same as I'm going to kill your boyfriend. One of them is actionable and is actually, you can fill out a police report for that. It's actually assault. I'm going to kill you or your boyfriend. I don't like you and I think you should die is protected, ugly as it is, is protected by free speech. Well, um, that actually depends on the circumstances. I don't like you and I think you should die, said under circumstances where you might mean it, right, um, yeah, isn't protected. It's an opinion. But, but really, but what you're saying is... Uh, mean, it as in, mean it as a threat. All right. Uh, what you're arguing for is something that the American judicial system has not adopted and has explicitly and repeatedly rejected. Now, that, well, one can argue, and I'm glad to have that argument with you, about what direction we ought to go in uh, on that. But I think the audience ought to, ought to know that, that what the law is at this time and has been for some time is that every almost every example that you cited is protected by the First Amendment. So. If, the president, if, the, if a candidate for president of the United States says what Donald Trump did about Muslims and Mexicans, he would have committed a criminal offense throughout Western Europe. That would be a crime. That, that could well be a crime in Canada. I mean, these are serious democratic countries. Uh, we go in a different direction. And the First Amendment has repeatedly uh, in, in the Skokie case and in lots of other cases been held to mean that we protect that speech. So without, without lighting the microphone, should we go that way? Did the, did the courts go on a, the wrong path? I think they went on the right path. I'm more concerned about the dangers of the suppression of speech, even the horrible speech that, that you cite. Uh, than I am about the impact of it. Sure, we have, we have a body of law of, about true threats. We have some law about incitements to criminal conduct and the like. But we go very far, and I think with great success, 
as a general proposition uh, in, in saying that even that sort of speech, which as I say, other democratic nations would punish and would punish criminally and would keep candidates from running from office who say those things. I mean, in England, they had a case not so long ago with a person with a placard showing the World Trade Center coming down and a sign uh, opposing the Islamification of England. England first. We would allow that. That's a crime there. It violates their law. It is one way a democratic country can go, and it's the direction that they've gone. Uh, the, the way we have gone is, is to have broader protection for speech, uh, even speech which is extremely painful and sometimes even dangerous. So since we're at a public university, uh, it's, that's a great jumping off point to the issue of safe spaces. And for anybody who doesn't know what a safe space is, it effectively says at this dormitory, at this campus, at this student union, there will be no hate speech tolerated, no anti-gay, uh, racist, uh, sexist speech tolerated. And Rich, I'm gonna pose this question to you because, what was that murmur? <laughs> I think this is a great topic. Liberal or conservative, everyone needs to be very concerned by what it means to create a safe space in a public space, like a public university. Who's writing the rules as to what is free speech? Because Floyd just told you, our country, our government, government, university, protects speech even when it's ugly. So who's writing the rules as to what constitutes free speech in a safe space, and is that legal? Yeah, and um, you know, I don't think we should have, in the, in the context we're talking, I don't think we should have safe spaces uh, in, uni in any university. Uh, uh, I, I think the way I understand it. Understanding, by the way, the laudable motivation, right? No, let's, I, let's all be clear. The, the motives are laudable. Uh, I, I don't know if people. I'd give you that. I don't know if I'd give you that. I, I'm going to give you that. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I, I think it's censorship. It's it, it censorship. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that. I'll, it's censorship in service of a, a, a laudable end. Um, and we're certainly not talking about physical safety. Obviously, we're all, we, we want people to be able to have lots of passionate discourse you know, without being physically threatened. Um, but to call something a safe space, I, I, so I'd, I'd like to have that conversation. Um, I wouldn't put up a Confederate flag. I, I don't think, I, I think it's an odious thing, but I wouldn't, until I heard you say that, I wouldn't have understood, and I don't know that it's, and I don't know that it's generally understood that putting up a, a, a Confederate flag equals a death threat. I, I don't know that. I'm willing to have that, I'd like to have that discussion. Um, but I don't want to foreclose that subject by saying we are ensconced in this safe space that's, that's not going to admit any contrary viewpoints. I think that's a really good point. You know, there, there is this notion, I think it goes back to putting up a Confederate flag. Is that a, I don't like you? Or is that flag a, I'm going to kill you? And how can you say, uh, without the articulation of those motives, what it means? I'm gonna bracket that question. Um, first, we keep using the word we, right? We talk about our when we shouldn't. It's a very narrow band of the population that gets to make these decisions uh, from uh, uh, the, as appellate court judges or Supreme Court judges. So we haven't really participated in discussing this at all. What I have pointed out today is that we have, we, meaning white people, have ways of dealing with disorderly conduct that affects them, have ways of dealing with intentional infliction of emotional distress as it affects them, have ways of dealing with group defamation when it affects them, fighting words when it affects them, and threats when it affects them. What we've done in each of those categories, we now meaning, you know, again, white people, we have plucked out from those doctrines things that affect non-white people. So if your terrible words are racist, well, that's a get out of jail free card. If your terrible words are directed against women, then we'll treat them as words our First Amendment uh, has to just, we just have to tolerate it. We'll let that go out of the box. Um, hey, at this university, you can't display conduct unbecoming of a student unless that conduct unbecoming of a student is anti-gay 
or racist or anti-immigrant, then we'll call it free speech. So we've plucked all of these exceptions out um, as they affect the groups that we have never wanted to include in. And then we say, oh my goodness, what are we doing to make our space safe? Well, these are ways in which you can make the space safe for everybody, not just the white people they were meant for. Weren't they plucked back in? I don't think that makes any sense, but they were plucked out without question, and weren't they put back in when we included women and minorities well, uh, and people of color in uh, protected classes? Well, so this is the thing. Um, uh, we often look at anti-discrimination law in this country and now we're jumping from First Amendment, but we look at anti-discrimination law as if it is effective. Uh, Alan David Freeman once called this legitimating racial discrimination through anti-discrimination law. Most of our discrimination laws are designed to go after the intentional act of discrimination, but almost nobody says they're doing it on purpose anymore. Even Donald Trump says he's not a racist. So no one is intentionally discriminating anymore. You'll find very few people who intentionally discriminate, and when they do it, um, they're not necessarily going to leave a trail, even if they do do it intentionally. They won't say, I am now doing this to harm you in this way because you are black. And if you can prove that now, you can get some kind of recompense uh, for only the amount of harm you proved in this specific instance. That's not even how discrimination is experienced. It's experienced uh, in every part of life, as walking through a kind of toxic ocean of American life. So when you can only go after a small slice of it through the law, you've guaranteed that we won't go after most of it. It will fail, it will look like it's successful, and so we'll legitimate the discrimination that goes on through having a set of anti-discrimination laws that purport to work, but don't. So, so no, um, we haven't included anyone. And let's look at the narrow band of time. Right? It's only since 1967 that the Supreme Court stopped putting its stamp of approval on white supremacy. 1967 with Loving versus Virginia. So from the beginning of the nation to now, we have slavery, we have segregation, we have 1967, great, the Jimi Hendrix experience, I guess, and then we have um, uh, immediately calls that we have gone uh, uh, far too far. Now, mind you, between the civil rights movement and the present, we've seen no material changes. Right? We've seen lots of symbolic changes, but by every measure of black-white inequality, then is the same as now. So we congratulate ourselves very quickly right, about how much we've included people and how well we've done, and, how then, and then we get to the point where safe spaces are now terrible. Well, they're not. Right? The only way we can all get together is some set of artificial rules, because we're not, we're not used to getting along. Right? Nothing in our history has us getting along. You know, when you see people, people get upset over the black players not standing up and saluting the flag, it's not about the flag, it's said, but why don't we make it about the flag? That flag has waved over more years of slavery and segregation than anything else. <laughs> it's not about the anthem. That anthem's third stanza celebrates the terrorizing and killing of black slaves who were fighting to free their wives and children from slavery. So why should anybody be singing that anthem? Everyone should be ashamed to have that as our anthem. These things, which are easy to say, right, and sound shocking to some people, show how, lit how first, how few people get to talk about what's real in this country, and how little distance we have traveled from slavery to now. And how irrelevant that is to the First Amendment. Uh, well, well, I, and I, I disagree. There's a blending. There, there, I'm, I'm thinking the same thing. I'm on a First Amendment panel, and I don't want to stop what you're saying. Um, first of all, I don't want to be considered a racist for saying I, I've got to move this back to First Amendment, because I do think what you're saying is important. And there is a blending of what we've discussed in this panel. The take a knee is about racism, and it's a First Amendment issue, too. So we are blending these topics. But I think it tells us that we are definitely not a perfect society, whatever um, we think we are. And I want to, you, you did ask me about the anti-discrimination rules. Absolutely. So that's why I responded with 100%. the anti-discrimination rules. 100%. Um, and by the way, I'm an immigrant, but no, no. As am I. But nobody calls me that. <laughs> no, I think it's fascinating. I've never felt a chill of being an immigrant. I've never feared uh, not being able to bring my family here. I've never felt that because I'm white. 
I'm one of those immigrants that doesn't count, apparently, in some of these um, rules limiting who's allowed to come and who it isn't. And I am fully aware of that in, in the way I walk freely to work and back every day. And I have no concerns about that. Let, let's, let's come back a little bit towards the topic um, of, of speech. And I mean, this is kind of a roundabout way of getting one of the news items into this panel, because I do find it interesting. And Christine, I think you're the person who can address it. Harvey Weinstein, uh, big Hollywood mogul, uh, unraveling before our eyes due to myriad claims of sexual harassment, some going so far as to allege rape, unfounded, unproven as of yet, but there are investigations ongoing right now in London and in New York that we know of. But what's curious to me is the story, because plenty of players have known about Harvey's um, modus operandi for decades. Not everyone has known that he has the propensity toward rape. I wouldn't say that that's something people have known and have buried. I don't know that. But the story has been passed over time and time again. Ronan Farrow published the story in print, says he was unable to do so in broadcast because he said NBC passed and said the story wasn't vetted enough or complete enough. He disagrees. He said it was plenty complete. I want you to talk a little bit about the chill of litigation and the power of corporations. It may not be the president or the government coming down and threatening to shut down NBC, mm -hmm. but there is another way that that can happen. Sure. Um, obviously, the, the allegations um, you know, involving Harvey Weinstein are, are awful, um, and I am not, a, you know, I'm not a privy to other news organizations and, and or uh, whether or not they've had the story or reasons for uh, reasons for publishing or not publishing, uh, but your your broader question about you know the chill of litigation on important stories um, and uh, you know the the, this, the decision making that goes on behind the scenes about whether or not to publish a story or not. Um, you know, I can I can attest to you know months long. Uh, you know, vetting processes or, or pre-publication review, discussions with, with editors and journalists about whether or not, you know, the, they have the story or not, right? Um, these are not, uh, you know, decisions that are taken lightly uh, when, when the, the papers or broadcast stations decide to go with the story. Um, uh, is litigation today a, a, a threat and a concern? Of course it is. You know, we've seen um, very large litigations against um, many uh, media companies that have ended, um, you know, some victorious and some not. Um, but I think at the end of the day and at the bottom line um, is, you know, is this a newsworthy story um, where the, the journalism is strong and tight and good and can we go with it? And my job, and I could you know, say uh, many First Amendment attorneys who, 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 who get into this line of work uh, from the get-go feel very passionately about um, that role and helping those stories, uh, and I, I touched upon this earlier, uh, get published. So uh, while I do think, of course, litigation is a concern, I don't think it is um, you know, the deterrent to those big stories uh, that need to get published that the people need to know. So if it's, let's just say it's not the Weinstein story. Yeah but a story just like it. How does it become a decades-long football if it's not the chill of being sued by a powerhouse? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I mean, maybe it is. I would just be speculating um, you know, about what was going on um, uh, there. Um, and sure, there are many examples that we can give of folks uh, that have a lot of money um, that could, uh, you know, cause a lot of problems uh, for uh, a publication about a, a story, you know. But I, I have to have faith that if you're publishing truthful, uh, you know, information, um, that it would be really hard to sit for a deposition under oath and answer questions um, that is not going to establish that what the publication said was true. I have, I have a really hard time. So I, I, I do believe. Um, you know, I do believe in that, in the power of the pen, 
uh, in, in putting those stories out there. Um, and I, um, I think there are a lot of media organizations today, mine included, that, um, you know, feel, uh, re, you know, feel the obligation, uh, that's why we, we have, you know, been doing this for over 100 years, uh, to, to to those important stories. So, Can Richard. I just add, actually, that I yeah. think, I, I, uh, first, uh, Hearst is particularly vigilant in both its care and its defense of First Amendment uh, uh, rights. Thank you, Floyd. Uh, no, I mean, uh, she got her training through but, you, by the but, way. Uh, I, just uh, I learned from the best. <laughs> yeah, what am I running for? Right? Uh, uh, but, but this is a time in which suddenly we, we are seeing uh, a, a change of mood and attitude in the public and the uh, judiciary and the like. Uh, which is a matter of concern. I mean, ABC settled a case in South Dakota about the pink slime broadcast they did, some of you may, may remember, you know, for $181 million and possibly uh, insurance money on top of that. Uh, uh, time, uh, HBO is being sued in West Virginia uh, for John Oliver's uh, very funny uh, a, a attack on the head of the largest coal company there. Uh, the Hulk Hogan case? Things, yeah. Well, the, the Hulk Hogan case is indeed the best example. You know, we're gawkers out of business uh, in a case financed by a uh, Hollywood billionaire. Uh, now, you know, that doesn't mean this story or that story should have been published or that it, some of them may or may not have violated what, what the law is, but, uh, and I don't know what's happening in newsrooms, but I do know that, that, that there is a, uh, a, a change in the air and it is not in the direction uh, of the press uh, or of broadcast press or the like in terms of the greater level of risk uh, that they're now subjected to. And, and I can only assume that, uh, you know, they have more lawyers looking harder and making tougher decisions about uh, what to publish and what not. I have no idea uh, about the Weinstein case, but, but uh, I, I, my prediction would be that, uh, you know, we, we are likely to see more stories killed than used to be the case for fear of libel litigation. And, and since you're the um, master of, of libel, you argue uh, Sullivan, correct? No, but, but. I thought you were part of Sullivan. I like to take credit. No. no. It's in your bio. <laughs> no, and in fact, I was even too young. Uh, uh, yeah. What's this credit that I saw in your bio for Sullivan? What did you do with Sullivan? Uh, uh, I think you mean the Pentagon Papers case. No, I knew that too. Uh, My, I was I, not an, I, uh, I was a first year associate. Uh, and a firm that did not represent the New York Times in okay. the, in, in the New York Times versus um, Sullivan case. But since I, I think Sullivan's a fascinating case because it established the, the precedent of malice having to be oh, present, absolutely. correct? So for a libel case, uh, when you're talking about a big media entity like New York Times, uh, the New York Times printed a story and were sued for libel and it went to the Supreme Court and malice was the critical element that was established. It was not there. So in the Weinstein case, or in any other one of these cases, or in any of the cases you need to vet on a regular basis, it, it seems hard to believe, Floyd, that you're saying that when so many of these cases are corroborated by many, meaning the Weinstein accusers, the Roger Ailes accusers, the Cosby accusers, how could they all have collaborated on the same malice? Well, first of all, malice doesn't mean what malice means, only lawyers talk like that. Uh, 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 actual malice in the legal sense means publishing something that you don't believe that is false, that you either know is false or suspect is false. It's not, not that you want to get someone which is a different sort of malice. With an intention uh, though? Is there an intentional, is there an it intentional has to be an, yes. It has to be a state of mind right. of either knowing it's false or suspecting uh, that it's false. Uh, look, after the fact, uh, you know, now you could say anything about Harvey Weinstein. Uh, and, and after, you know, the world comes down 
uh, with more and more witnesses and more and more people saying, I was there, I was victimized. Uh, there's every reason and every protection for the press if some uh, additional person comes in and says he attacked me to go with the story on the grounds that it, it's entirely plausible, period. Uh, but, but that's very different than when you're the first one doing the story and uh, you know you have to be you have to be solid and that that's what Christine is talking about being I think this might be a good point to revisit the culture war thing New York Times versus Sullivan what was how many of you know what was going on in that case it was almost the end of the civil rights movement the south had figured out how to win this thing they you just sue civil rights agitators in the south you will win every single time, and you will win history-making awards against the journalists who are covering the Southern Civil Rights Movement. This will destroy the movement, because its big strategy had been to go to a lunch counter, to register to vote, get beaten in front of cameras, and have those cameras broadcast it to the North and to the rest of the world. Broadcasting within the South didn't matter because the South was solid. There were virtually, there were very, very few white dissenters um, against the southern apartheid system. So if they could shut off the cameras, which they would have been able to do but for a Supreme Court intervention, then they could shut down at least the nonviolent um, uh, strategy of the civil rights movement. The New York Times was facing um, libel judgments in excess of its worth. Right? This was gonna mean, okay, we can't cover it because that's, that will explode the enterprise. Anything is possible. Right, these narrow wins uh, aren't, uh, aren't, aren't permanent. Some of the coverage of the story, some stories, have a lot to do with you know, what's the audience like now? Like, do we have, how many people can read a newspaper critically and talk about it? We've dropped the ball. William, any, you guys know William Burroughs? So, so William Burroughs, I think, it's, I think he's the one who said this, says that the, you know, pushers don't sell their junk to the junkie. You sell the junkie to the junk, you degrade the consumer down to the level of the product that you want them to consume. Right? A naked lunch moment, also William Burroughs, is when everybody sees what's actually at the end of every fork. So that's what November 8th was for us, unless we forget, right? If each time we treat a situation normal, situation is normal, we will forget exactly how crazy a world we are living in and exactly how crazy and beyond discussion many of our fellow citizens are. This has not, not to do with the narrow confines of the First Amendment, but it has to do with what the First Amendment is designed to protect, which is free expression. We don't have a culture anymore of discourse because that implies that we have a culture of people who enjoy thinking and argument and who have the courage to know things. And that got erased. Yeah, but the problem is your, your world view or your cultural view excludes lots of people from being able to participate in that discourse. So I'm excluded. No, it doesn't. I'm excluded because I'm white. No, nope, you I, are and not. I, and I can't understand. So by, by, by your terms, I can't have that conversation because I just don't understand what the rest of the world faces every day. So this is a typical conservative routine. So I look out, I see a lot of white faces. Did anything I say make someone here feel excluded? Me. Well, but you're not the only white person here. And you've got another white guy there. So two of you guys. Yeah, but, um, but they don't listen but, to WAMC though, so. Well, but there are plenty of white people here who did not feel excluded by what I said. So to say that I am excluding white people is ridiculous. But what you are excluding are a lot of uneducated people you are excluding are people who can't have a serious, sophisticated conversation with you, either about race or anything else. No, and I they am not. get to vote, and we would not take that away from them. I am not excluding them. I'm saying we have excluded them. Who's the we now? Um, well, this is how we have degraded people down to the pro like when we look at when we look at the Brown versus Board of Education, which was brought up earlier, right, in our discussion. Brown versus Board of Education did what exactly? The schools are still segregated. We didn't establish a right to literacy. We re read the First Amendment in such a, a, a um, narrow way that we don't view it as a right to literacy. Imagine how we would organize ourselves differently if we said, to petition the government for redress of grievances, um, 
right? If that's what we need to keep ourselves free, then we need a population that can do that most effectively. And literacy has been proved to be one of the most effective tools for organizing your thoughts, matching it to the thoughts of others, matching it to thoughts of the past. So everybody has a right to that. We ignore the 13th Amendment in this, in this discussion. Like, what's slavery like? Slavery is like illiteracy. If we're getting rid of slavery, as we said we would do with the 13th Amendment, we're banning it, then the things that go with slavery, number one amongst those is illiteracy. It was against the law to teach a slave to read, and they were punished often with cutting off fingers if they were caught knowing how to write. So if we viewed the Constitution through a lens that wasn't designed to return us back in time, to have these things that look like freedoms, make them not work, Right, make them not work and have people believe, oh, we're free now, I just don't know why everything looks the same. Right, we legitimate all these discriminations through a bunch of uh, rules, amendments, uh, interpretations that are designed uh, to fail and where we've only consulted a very narrow band of our population. But your constitution is a series of metaphors aimed at getting where you want to get as a matter of public policy. I mean, what you would like, and we would all like, more people to be literate, to say that's, that's a First Amendment requirement, or whatever other amendment you, 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 choose, you choose to put it under, uh, seems to me just insupportable. Except it has nothing to do with what the, the protection against the government that the Bill of Rights was written and interpreted to, to be about. Um, I think that's absolutely not true. I think you're completely wrong. Well, we can agree not allowed. Um, before I open up the mics to, because to, I think there'll be a lot of people with a lot of questions, I want to tackle one more topic that's near and dear to my heart. Anybody been to Vellus, Macedonia? Anyone ever heard of Vellus, Macedonia? It's a lovely place. Um, they used to make a lot of money in the porcelain business. That was really what that town was all about, porcelain industry. And then, you know, the bottom fell out and uh, they're broke. And so they found another industry where most of the people who were out of work, and I think it was upwards of like 60% of the young people who were out of work there, uh, found another industry. And oh my God, did it pay? And it wasn't that hard. It was writing. It was speech. It was fake news. So when you hear fake news, I said it at the beginning, there is such a thing as fake news. They are mills for creating content that are bound to get a click. Because every time you click, those folks in Vellus get a little percentage of a penny. And it amounts to $60,000, $70,000 for people who were used to making about 14 before they lost their jobs at the porcelain plant. So the fake news industry uh, exists in places like Vellus. And they are ginning up and gearing up for the next election. They create, they create Facebook accounts and they populate them with things like um, I wish I had the actual headlines in front of me because they're just delightful. They're really National Enquirer like headlines, like Hillary Clinton beat up a child. Or, oh, Pizzagate, that was a real one. Hillary Clinton was running a private se a child sex uh, operation out of a pizzeria in Washington. Uh, people click them like crazy, and the more they had Trump in them, the more they got clicked. So they just ran amok. And when the president invokes the term fake news, he's talking not about what is really a dangerous thing and is fake news. He's talking about everybody he doesn't like. My question to the panel is, I think fake news is terrible. I think it's affected our democracy. I think it has a way in 2020 of affecting us even more. I think the Russians have harnessed fake news and are adoring every moment that our Facebook consumerism in America gobbles up in our uh, echo chamber. But what can you do? I'm sorry if I'm boring you. I promise I'll wrap this. What can you do about fake news when it's free speech, Richard? Me? I thought yes. You Next. <laughs> um, I, I agree with you that, that the, the president conflates, as he is sometimes wont to do, uh, conflates the fake news that you talk about with real news reporting that he just doesn't like. And I think there's a big difference between the two. Um, the, I, and I think, I'm guessing, I'm gonna punt this to you, because I, I feel like people in your industry look at truly fake news, like what Ashley's talking about, the way people 
on my side of the spectrum look at look at people like you know the real ranters uh, the Milo Emmy what's the guy's name Milo yeah, yeah like Milo Yiannopoulos um, because you say that that's not me that doesn't represent me and then when somebody especially the president groups it together and says fake news you know the fake news being ginned up onto Facebook versus reporting I don't like it's it it could be maddening. Uh, two two responses to the. I think it's in two categories. One is from the, uh, you know, sort of, if you absorb but established media perspective, what do you do about fake news? And I think, um, and I think it was Tim Wu who said this uh, in one of the first panels, which is standards and ethics, um, I think are, are really crucial and, and, uh, and key in that, and really strong editors. I mean, this, the, to have a strong editor today, to be able to, uh, you know, delve into is really important. The second point, however, though, is it's a Facebook problem. I mean, what you're really saying um, in terms of those cl clicks um, and how folks are seeing that and what's in their feeds, the First Amendment does not apply to Facebook. Um, whether or not they choose to change their practices um, for uh, ethical reasons or you know, to, to acknowledge that this is happening um, is, is a question. So, Professor Farley, your thoughts about Facebook now being a massive corporation, an industry of propagating falsities throughout, you know, our democracy, it's a bad thing, but is it actionable? Is it, is it really anything that we can do about it? Or is it just caveat emptor? Um, so, Michel Foucault once wrote that the most fragile instance, instant has roots. Right, the roots, if we feel that our democracy is really fragile right now, that had roots. And those roots actually had to do with the production of people who don't care about knowing things. Um, so Facebook has its um, dangers. Um, it's, I think I've contributed all of my time to Facebook, so that's dangerous. But the, the ways in which closer attention to educating the entire citizenry would have prevented us from getting to that point. Uh, that is, there are a whole bunch of people now who think build a wall is an argument. But right? there are a whole bunch of people who think grab them by the genitals. Um, I don't know what they think about that. I'm afraid to... What? Yeah, they think it's locker room talk. I'm not sure what locker rooms they've been in. I guess the rape locker room <laughs> before the rape game. Um, but this inattention to detail, this attention, this inattention to scholarship, this inattention to the value of an argument, the focus on just winning, which is a kind of focus on money, right? Do you in America we say, no, oh, did you do you buy what he said? Right, that, that where we, we, we don't really care about speech as speech, we just care about winning and money and, and who's ahead. And this has left us vulnerable to the people who are ahead, uh, frankly, only because of money. So I'm not as worried about Facebook as I am worried about the people who the are on Facebook. I the think we have been something. degraded down to the lowest level in the industrialized world. Right, yeah. we have serious people who say that the President of the United States, serious, sober people say he is a madman. They make cogent, clear arguments that he may be out of his head. This is not, this would have been bad science fiction just a few years ago, mm -hmm. but that's where we are now. But leading up to him being the President, we had, I hate to say, a lot of serious people believing that the former President wasn't born here. Right. Led by the so current president. So it's not just the uneducated. Yeah, my fear, while I respect what you say, and I believe that that is a, that is a core issue, that is a core problem, we are an uneducated country for the most part. Um, many of the educated are as much to blame. Uh, if you mean many of the credentialed are as much to blame, then that's correct, and I should have been a little bit clearer. Um, by education, I don't just mean you have a GED or a high school diploma or a college degree. I mean you're a person who likes words. <laughs> big words? Many no, words? Not, not big <laughs> words. You're a person who likes to know things, who I'm likes to talk about things. I'm the president's own language himself. He's a man. I know, I know a lot of words. 
I know right. a lot of oh, words. Oh, I know the best. I know the best words. My the best words, words are the my words are the best words. I consult will... myself. I have a very good brain. <laughs> Floyd, some some thoughts uh, about uh, about fake news. I think we do have a Facebook problem, and Facebook thinks it has a Facebook problem uh, because there are a lot of people, uh, as you initially said, who uh, deliberately, not because they're stupid, and not because they're wrong. Uh, but because they're willing to engage in a sort of verbal fraud who make up news, uh, purported news, and, and can have an enormous, and do have uh, an enormous impact, and are likely, I'm afraid, to have more of an impact uh, on our political, social life uh, in the future than in the past. Uh, and. Uh, it will fall to Facebook, uh, in particular Facebook, uh, from which more people get their news than any other place in the history of the world right now, uh, uh, to do something that the government might not be allowed to do, which is to bar from what it carries what is, quote, fake news, which means that we want, or I want, and Facebook is sort of signing on to this now, we want them to read or have some way that their algorithms will transmit to them uh, the information from which they can decide we won't carry that because it's untrue, untrustworthy, uh, or racist, uh, or the like. Uh, all sorts of things that the government can't do because of the First Amendment are, are things that I think we will be looking and necessarily looking to this enormous corporation, Facebook, to do. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, they've already said they're going to hire a few thousand more people uh, to start down that road. Uh, the, the Russian example, I think, is perfect. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what they did. I mean, that, that really happened. It's likely to happen more. Uh, they fabricate things, make up things, design it for particular audiences, which they have the capacity to do, send it in to particular geographic areas aimed at particular social classes, religions, races, and the like, and have enormous impact. And they have the capacity to do that. The question is, do they have the capacity to undo some of that by barring uh, from what they carry uh, some of this genuinely uh, fake, fabricated, untrue, and very dangerous non-news? I'm going to ask. Um, I'm going to ask um, one last question of Rich. I want him to respond to this. But in the meantime, I'm going to ask anyone who'd like to ask a question to line up behind these two microphones that are um, perfectly positioned to attack either side of the panel. Um, and I just want you to bounce off that if you can, because I think I've read somewhere in your past that you're 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 not crazy about big corporations being able to edit what we see, and yet Floyd sees that as potentially the answer to what the government can't do. Yeah, I actually, uh, I, I think I disagree with Floyd a little, and I actually agree with the professor, which probably affects both of you differently. Uh, the, uh, I, I, I think that, I don't, I don't think it's Facebook that's the problem. I think it's education and literacy, and if you're telling me that there's some, uh, yes, I see that as, as a discrete problem if, if people are making up accounts, but if you're telling me that people are making their political decisions based upon ads or information they're getting over Facebook. Oh my God, they used to do it over flyers. Yeah, I know, but, uh, but I, th then, I'm, then I, I think there's a deeper problem, and I think that is a and problem. And they used that, to do it over Jay Leno. I, I, I mean, know they are, but, but when those algorithms that none of us here understand start, start by getting rid of fake news and then start morphing into getting rid of hate speech and then start morphing into get, getting rid of anything that Jeff Zuckerberg doesn't like, I, I think that becomes a dangerous and slippery slope. Uh, the, Anthony. I, I want to say this. The, the algorithms are there anyway. So there's no, there's no getting rid of them, and they are a danger. 
Um, that, that's true, we agree. Um, we agree on this. Facebook didn't land us where we are right now. Um, and, we, and the reason I say that is we have to actually face a problem that we now know about a large portion of our population. Right? The majority, a super majority of white men voted for a guy who talked about raping women and building a wall. A majority of white women voted for that same guy, of white women voters who voted. No other population did that, right? Black women were 94% against Trump. Black men voted against Trump. Uh, Latino men, Latino women, uh, uh, Asian but women. But didn't vote Asian in the men. numbers that were expected. Did not turn out. The black vote did not turn out in the numbers that were expected. Why is that? Um, well, um, that wasn't the election, right? The surprise news of the election, if we want to talk about November surprises, is that most white women voters voted for a guy who says he rapes women. Now that's what I take grab him by the pussy to mean. Like that's rape in Massachusetts. Uh, it's sexual assault here in New York. Uh, it's a crime in just about everywhere you want to go. So that was a surprise, right? But I don't think Facebook is actually what landed us there. I think we have to look at the terrible things that must have happened, the weird ideas that are in the heads of these people who voted that way uh, in September. I'm gonna take and, a good long look at who we are. Um, here we are. Why don't we start over here? Um, my question is... is can, you, can you speak up a little? Get closer to the microphone. Excuse me? Get closer to the microphone. Okay. There, thank you. <laughs> uh, here's my question. There are two employment cases, one of which has got massive amount of ink, which you've talked about, the NFL players who, as far as I know, haven't said one word or anything about their argument, and then the firing of Mr. Damore from, I don't remember, Google or Facebook, who made, in words, a coherent argument, and uh, he was fired because they didn't like his ideas. I'm just wondering if you wanted to comment on, um, you know, obviously the lack of First Amendment freedom for Mr. Damore that everybody thought the NFL players should have. So your, your question is comment on the employment firings of yeah, do you know the two case? different cases yeah. whereby... Yeah. Yeah. What's, the, what's, your, yeah, what's your question? Well, um, everybody... It's the guy at Google who, who uh, yeah. had a, ma a post uh, which is uh, basically said that uh, women perform less well than right. men. Uh, on the job. So uh, it's a question that, about whether they and, should and or should not. And that it's about not. time that we recognize it. That's what it said. Yeah. And he yeah, was fired. I'm making the point that everybody on this panel seems to be so concerned about NFL players who are making an argument, I suppose, but they're not using words, which this gentleman said to be really important. Yeah, they I mean, are using words. That's a silly thing to say about them. Well, what words are they saying? Have you heard any argument from them? Yeah. Yes. Well, yes. What argument have they made? I, I've heard a very, a very articulate argument made over and over again that this is not against the United States of America, this is not against the flag, this is not against the anthem. This is a chance to use an audience, the only chance where we have an audience, to stand up for something that's affecting our oppressed brothers and sisters. It's, it's super clear to me. Okay. Well, that's an argument, okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me take a question over here. So I am concerned that mainly this panel has been talking about the uh, rights, uh, First Amendment rights of uh, journalists and public figures. Um, I'm also, I mean, I think one of the reasons that we're having this attack on the First Amendment in this country right now by, by our president and by others is because the corporate media hasn't done much to lift up the First Amendment rights of people who are exercising them that don't have access to media. I mean, there's a whole lot of protest activities, resistant activities happening all across the country. It's not covered by the media. So I will argue, um, and I think Christina could probably speak better to it, but in terms of Black Lives Matter, it's all we covered. Uh, in terms of Occupy Wall Street, it's all we covered. Um, and right now, there were anti-Trump rallies all across the nation, and it's all we covered. I'm not sure, if, are, is there another I mean, area? there are still anti-Trump rallies happening. Sure, just but we're, down, not covering just down, we're covering just, hurricanes right now. I mean, there's only uh, yeah, so much well, bandwidth. I mean, what I'm saying is I would like to see more discussion of the ethics of journalism 
and how you, you're very concerned about your own First, First Amendment rights, I appreciate that, but we need to promote and you need to lift up the First Amendment rights of others that are demonstrating, like Congressman Faso has people at his office every Friday talking about why he should be not in office and why he doesn't represent the interests of his district. That's not covered by any of the local media. We don't get very good coverage about any of these kind of activities. Well, I'll, I'll let Christina I, address I do believe the, that it has been covered. Yeah. And, you know, to the, ex to the extent that, um, you know, again, the, there's a lot going on, um, you know, to Ashley's point uh, in terms of, of issues of the day, but those, those issues are covered. And, you know, to the extent that they're not, I urge you to write a letter to the editor. Uh, I would say I think the journalists um, did fail us, but there are ways in which technology has changed the terrain. Everyone has a camera in their phone. Um, all these um, police killings of black people that have been in the news for uh, uh, the last two years um, are a product of, the, now you're on film. Now we don't have to argue about what went on. We can show it on camera. There's a discussion that we haven't really had, uh, not about the police killing of black people in city after city and the fact that they do it with impunity, but the fact that a lot of people who watch those films, who watch Eric Garner choke to death for selling cigarettes, look at the film and just say, meh, doesn't bother me. Right? Those are the Trump voters. They look at that and they don't see anything that bothers that. And we haven't had the discussion about that population, right? the one that is down to the level of the product they voted for in November 8th, on November 8th. A question over here. Um, I have more of a comment than a question. Um, regarding the safe spaces that you spoke about earlier, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the safe spaces are supposed to protect against hate speech, against minorities, gays, etc. And there are those who <coughs> disagree with having those safe spaces, but I can almost guarantee you that if the safe spaces was speech against white folks, they would be asking for safe spaces. My second comment is with regards to the NFL protests, which is supposed to be protesting against police brutality. And this is how they choose to do it. It has absolutely nothing to do with the military, nothing to do with the flag. Um, I mean, if you ask me, I have my own issues against the anthem. It glorifies war. And if you ask me, our anthem should be America the Beautiful. But it's got nothing to do, and the, their speech has been so hijacked that all we're talking about is it being against the military as opposed to against police brutality. Okay, and if y'all care to comment on that, thank you. I, I think the, the panel has had a lot to say about that and we wanna make sure that there are as many topics as we can, so I would like to continue, but I do appreciate the comment. Next. Hi, um, I wanna thank everyone for um, making this possible and thank you for uh, on the panel, everyone here to, for, for contributions, because the discourse is really important and I'm very grateful for the First Amendment and more grateful for the spirit of the First Amendment. And thank you for mentioning that. Thanks for coming. Thank you. That's um, just as important. I'm only gonna ask one question, but I have many, and they're all about how can we change this? Um, so whether or not you agree with it, I feel that um, people have a responsibility to um, protect the welfare of the people. And when we're talking about hate as a form of speech, hate is harmful. It, uh, it hurts people. Um, it kills people sometimes. And um, when we're talking about free speech at universities, um, we have examples where someone has been killed, people have been harmed. Um, it's also very expensive. So um, that's not gonna be a question, but I just wanna point out it's very expensive for, for an institution to, to protect the welfare of people when we're talking about hate speech. So my question is, um, 
how, whether or not you agree with it, how could we be like other countries who, who have laws against hate speech? How could we do that? So I think it's a good question, and maybe we can also frame it as do we want to be like that? And Floyd, you brought it up at the beginning, that in Canada, in Germany, in France, in uh, England, you can't do certain things that you can do here. Do we want that? Well, first, uh, uh, on behalf of the panel, thank you. Uh, I think the first half of your of your query is is easier than the second. The first half is uh, sort of can we do it? Uh, how can we do it? Uh, I don't think we can do it by it meaning effectively changing that that uh, very uh, well established body of constitutional law which does protect against the government. Uh, um, hate speech. Uh, that respond to what I think is the harder issue is whether or not you know we can change the, the law. And again, um, uh, so long as we have a First Amendment and we have judges who have anything like the view that all nine of these judges did, and I, and I can just thinking back, you'd have to go back a long way to find someone who didn't share that view. Uh, I mean, how much more do we have to say than, uh, uh, yes, we have to have more education, and yes, we have to do things like teaching civics more uh, at lower levels of education, uh, which would not only deal with the Constitution, but would deal in a more direct way than most elementary schools and junior high schools do with racism. Uh, and and you know, the, the very core of the very speech uh, which we're talking about. Uh, but it's a long-term process. Uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, unavoidably a long-term process. Uh, I would add to your questions, uh, might we not be going in the wrong direction now? I mean, I'm saying if we would educate people better, maybe we could start to deal in a more effective way uh, with, the, with, with the vice of racism. Uh, my fear is, is that, uh, and in part because of this president, that we're moving backwards and away from uh, uh, even even trying incrementally uh, to, to deal with the problem. Um, we have time for, is it one more question, Paul? Just one more question. So just if you could make it quick so we could get the uh, panel to, to address it. On, on the subject of um, freedom of expression on university campuses, um, with all respect, I feel that Professor Farley's comments are really avoided the issue and were kind of misdirection. It's not about death threats. It's not about disorderly conduct. What it is about is an atmosphere of enforced ideological conformity on campuses, allowing only expression of a limited catechism of ideological positions and delegitimizing all others. I feel that too many times the left believes in freedom of expression only for itself. Comments? Well, I'll weigh in first because I agree with you. Uh, and, and there are times when anyone that cared, thought, or thinks I'm vaguely of the left. But in terms of the free speech angle of it, I, th I think you're right. Uh, it is conservative speakers who are shouted down, and it's conservative speakers who are not invited, and it's conservative speeches who are disinvited much more uh, than any other category of speakers. Uh, and I think that's a, a, a very dangerous and anti-First Amendment uh, uh, regime under which we live. I'm going to say that's nonsense. The two of you are united in nonsense. That's First the all, usual. That's a great argument. Well, I wanted, well let, me, let, me continue, let me continue it. So beginning, you know, nonsense. And let me explain why I see the two of you as united in nonsense. First, to talk about invitations, 
when you're talking about universities. You, to talk about that in terms of as excluding conservatives, you've got to leap over what, the, what a university is and who works there. Look at the complexion of the faculty at just about every university there is. And don't look at it just as a snapshot today. Look at how it has been over time, from its beginning to now. Put those faces on the wall and see what color they are, see what genders they are, um, see what classes they come from, and then talk about the diversity of the you know, knowledge production machines that we have around. Look at the student bodies and do the same thing. When I was at the University of Virginia, my father could not have gone there. You know, luckily, he you know, went to school in another country, and so we have happy education stories from the 40s in our family. The other part about the, uh, the invitation that unites uh, a, a kind of racist liberalism with a racist conservatism uh, uh, is this notion that it's, it's somehow the, it's, it's not understanding what a debate is. When you have a debate, we've all agreed to be equals to the debate. I can only debate with another person. A person de debates with me. If, if we get on stage and we're having a debate and somebody suddenly says, black people are, well, my personhood is now gone, and the debate is gone, and we shouldn't call that some kind of debate. And a rule against that isn't stifling debate, it's what makes for a debate. Before you have a, a university is supposed to be a bunch of debates, so the first rule is everybody who shows up there has to be treated as a debater. You can't say, women can't do math, and then expect the university to be a big debate, because you've then excluded them from the realm of the human. If, if a woman argues, oh, women can do math, or a black person argues, black people can think abstractly and study philosophy, they've actually, by even entering that argument, they've lost the argument, because they've said their very humanity is up for debate. So the thing you do with a university or a debate is you push some things off the table. Like, inequality is pushed off the table. You can't walk into a debate and say to your debate partner, you're a monkey, not a person. Conservatives always want to be free to make the monkey man argument. And then they oh, think that's they... nonsense. Come on now, that's just nonsense. Uh, it isn't what, nonsense. All of what you said, Professor Farley, with respect, well, is, is just not answering the issue at okay. all. Well, so I'm gonna, uh, just, I'm gonna say one thing to that, and that is that both of you just prefaced what you said with, that's nonsense. How about, I disagree. I think it's a much better way to say there's another point of view here rather than what you I say is nonsense. Him. I was mimicking him. Uh, I want no. two, two last comments. Well, wait, can I, I, I just want to say. I, there's a thing I want to say. That, that you you got to make it quick because Paul's already sure. here. That difference, between, <laughs> that, that difference between that's nonsense and I disagree yes. is very, very important. When yes. somebody marches in saying that they have a right to hate speech, speech that says, hey, you, black person, or something less than everybody else. That's what I take hate speech to be. I will never respond to that with, I disagree. I'm not gonna disagree about me. That's It'll nonsense. never end. <laughs> so Christine, All quickly. I was gonna yeah. say was, was one thing that you said was that, that you know, uh, universities are a place for debate. And I mean, I think, I think the, you know, a, a nice point hopefully to end is to say, you know, in terms of free speech principles and the whole purpose of, of education in, in university is to have these different viewpoints, allow the speech to happen so that people can learn from it. So I, I, I just wanted to sort of end on that note. And Rich, since you were so maligned by not being introduced in line, you get the yes. last word. You know, I, I, I agree with that. I, I think I give, uh, I give people enough credit um, to understand that we all come in with our own baggage and our own prejudices, and, but I give people enough, enough credit to think that, that you know, I, can, I can listen to the professor and listen to his point of view. I may not disagree, but at least I understand where he's coming from. And I do have to point out, I'm a conservative, and I was invited here, and uh, I was listened to with, with, with deference and, and respect, and I appreciate it, and I think the answer to the, the woman who asked, how do we fix this, is we continue doing this in forums like this and, and hope that truth will out. Yeah, and once again, yes. to, the woman who, to the woman who asked that question, Paul, yes. um, I, I just want to reiterate that while she thanked everybody for having this conversation, I think that the great thanks go, goes to you because you care. And I think, you know, Anthony said it best, we need to care. We need to give a damn. This is an important democracy, and it will fall apart unless we give a damn. So thanks for giving a damn. And, and <laughs>
And this is exactly why we're here. These conversations are not easy. They're often difficult. They're often complex. But we do let everyone have their say. I want to remind you, the final panel will be tonight at 7 p.m. You have time for a dinner break now. Floyd Abrams will be out in the lobby selling his book. But please thank Floyd Abrams, Anthony Paul Farley, Christina Findikian, Richard Honan, and Ashley Banfield.